One of the most surprising traditions I learned of in my study of the history of worship was this very popular tradition in the 17th, 18th century Britain, the Anglican Church, uh, of how they prepared for Christmas. There was an ad set of Advent sermons you'd get every year, and here were the four topics. Think of like, you're getting ready for Christmas, all the red, green, all, all festivities, right? And in the middle of this, the four Sundays you'd hear every year were on death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Now, if I announced that this Christmas, that, that's what we were going to do, right? We're getting ready for Christmas. Let's talk about death, judgment, heaven, and hell. How long do you think it'd take before I'd get my first phone call? Five minutes? <laughs> Are you sure about that, Andy? And yet, that was what was done back then, right? The, the, there was a, a, an expectation that the church was going to talk about the last things and talk about them on a yearly basis. Over the last century, that has not been the case. Something happened in about 1900 or so, and I'm going to give you a very, it's not even a thumbnail sketch of the history. This is almost a caricature, but I want you to understand a, a bit of what happened to give us where we are today, where that would be so shocking. In 1900 or so, uh, Protestant American Christianity split into sort of two halves, a main line to liberal and a conservative to fundamentalist, sort of two halves of, of that. And, and each branch, as it took its own path, it, it both both sides sort of lost an emphasis on last things, on the proverbial it. The, the sort of main line to liberal sort of had a passion for preaching the kingdom of God that it kind of faded. And, and the, uh, the sort of conservative to fundamentalist side of the ch Protestant American church had this zeal for preaching about judgment and, and, and hell and, and good fire and brimstone, but then the brimstone kind of cooled down and, and they stopped hearing, hearing that. And so both sides of, of the American Protestant church ended up in the same place of talking more about uh, progress, having a sense of right now, we're making progress, right now is as good as it can be, this is a great place and time to live. And so we ended up focusing on now, right now. And so... So the sort of the left, the sort of left mainline, the liberal side of the church focuses has this temptation to really focus on like how do we make everything perfect now, which shows up in an emphasis on legislation and policy and stuff like that. And then the conservative to fundamentalist side of the church is reading books like Joel Osteen. He has a new new book, and what's the name of the book? Live your best life. Now, right? That's the name of the book. Live your best life now. We're not going to talk about down the road. We're going to talk about living your best life now, right? And, and so both sides of the church are, are basically whiffing. Uh, this loss of focus on where we are headed, heaven, hell, judgment that there is death and something will happen, is not often discussed because, well, frankly, we're, we're comfortable. We tend to be very comfortable where we're at. We seem to be getting along decently. And so our, our discussion of the last things has thinned down to, we sing a few hymns, Jesus wins, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And uh, we, we, it's got, our discussion of the end has gotten very thin, and we tend to focus on living right now. Part of the assumption that undergirds this, this, uh, this understanding of the future, is if you imagine, like, if, if everyone's uh, life is a story, and we're, we're sort of filling out the book as we go, the story of our life, we have this assumption that the rest of the pages are blank. Right? I'm writing my story. It's my story. I'm determining it. You're determining your story. We're all, we're all determining our future as we go. We are all the masters of our journey, the captains of our soul. And yet, that's not the case if we follow Jesus, because if we follow Jesus, we follow him into reading Revelation. And Revelation tells us that the last chapter is known. Right? There is going, everyone will die, there is judgment, and, and we have heaven to, to look forward to. Right? And the fulfillment of the prayer that we pray every Sunday, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the future is not empty. Like if you look down the road, the future is not a seemingly never-ending set of blank pages waiting for us to fill it up. The future is already full, for the ending is set. The question is not what will happen, the question is, how do we get there? 
Further, as soon as we say that there is an ending point, as, long, as soon as we say we know where we land, the consummation of all that Jesus began, what we're saying is that today is transitory. Because anything that is today that isn't going to be in the kingdom of God will pass. Our strife, our divisions, right? There's a lot of things that we have built with human hands that will be passing when we get to the kingdom of God. Our, our politics, our nation, our culture, a lot of that will pass to be replaced with God's opinion, God's kingdom, God's politics. That this is our goal, that the end of the story is known, that we are heading towards God's kingdom, that is part of the good news of Easter. That's part of what we proclaim during this Easter season. That once that we accept that we are forgiven, that judgment need not be feared, that's when the healing begins. And to talk about healing is to say, well, if you're going to heal something, something's got to be broke. Right? To say that you need something needs to be healed is to, is to name that something is not how it ought to be, and to say, and this is how it should be. And, and we talk about healing all the time. We know where we want to land. Like, I'm, I'm going to a doctor tomorrow. He will tell me when he's going to cut on my shoulder, because it's broke. And, and I can tell you what healing is going to look like. Healing is going to look like being able to put shelf, a Fletcher on my shoulders again. And going to be able to throw acorns in the pond up at the Shabana Lake with Sophia. I can't do either right now. Something is broken. It needs to be healed. That's what I'm looking to do again. It needs to be made right. In the same way, what does a healed community, a healed nation, a healed world look like? When things are right. What is the word when things are healed and made right, when everything is as it ought to be? We call that when things are just, right? Justice. That is what, when, when things have been healed, things have been made whole, we say that things have been made just, when justice has been fulfilled. To talk about the end of the story is to talk about justice as the outcome. We are heading towards the kingdom of God, and in the kingdom of God, in God's way, in God's politics, in God's future, and when God writes the, has written the end of the story... We say that they will be healed and things will be just and made right and made as they ought to be. How often in your life do you have this moment of yearning for something better? When you say, this isn't how it ought to be. Right? Whenever you encounter, I mean, pick an ism, classism, ageism, sexism, whatever ism bothers you, whatever way you encounter the brokenness of reality, of creation, and you have that moment of thinking, there is a better way, this is not how it ought to be, that yearning for how things ought to be, that is what we're heading towards. The, the time when things are fixed and healed and made right, when justice is, is not just proclaimed, but a reality. When we look at what happens on the weekend of Easter, it is on the cross that sin is forgiven, right? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That is the forgiveness of sin. But the forgiveness of sin then leads to the resurrection, which is the triumph over sin, right? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do, is the response to sin. Resurrection is saying, but sin does not have the last word. Sin is not, brokenness is not going to have the last word. When we talk about justice, when we talk about how everything will be made right, when we are what we're talking about is the kingdom of God to come, when we all have been resurrected into this future. Now, there are glimpses of this in the Old Testament, and one of them that you, you have heard often is uh, this image of the lion, lion lying down with the lamb. And that's beautiful, and I appreciate that, but let me tell you what I go to. You want to talk about the Old Testament and what it tells us about the kingdom of God and, and when it describes heaven, I go to Amos 9. Because in Amos 9, what it talks about is on how God's holy mountain... All the people will be gathered who, who worship God, and God is their God, and, and they, are their pe they are his people. And, and all the people who gather there, the crop will be so good that those who reap and bring in the crop will not be able to get it all in before it's time to sow again. Right? For a people that is a farming people, can you think of anything better than that? 
a crop that is so good that you can barely get it all in before it's time to get back to it. And, and wine, the, it talks about the wine, the wine harvest, the grapes being so great that when you harvest the wine and you start to mash the wine, the grapes to make the wine, that the wine flows down the side of the mountain because it is so bountiful. And, and it is so bountiful that you can just say, you know what, it's okay, let some of it flow away. We have plenty. And the promise of Amos 9 is that God's people will live on God's holy mountain and have good work. They will live on their land and none shall take it for them and they will receive the, the work of their hands. That's pretty darn good, ain't it? It doesn't get much better than that when it comes to talking about the, the future, about how things are just, how things are as they ought to be. If you look at what Jesus proclaims, uh, he often speaks of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like this, or the kingdom of God is like this. And if you want to know what the kingdom of God looks like at an interpersonal level, you look at what Jesus does. The kingdom of God, well, in the kingdom of God, who is healed? Well, anyone who comes up to Jesus is healed. In the kingdom of God, anyone who is sick is made whole. Who is fed? Did anyone leave Jesus hungry? I mean, Deuter fed 5,000 at a swing, right? Who is welcome when it comes to the kingdom of God? Well, is there anyone that Jesus turns away? Who is powerful? What does Jesus invite? He invites people to embrace humility and service. Power is rooted in humility and service in the kingdom of God. Jesus sends his disciples out telling them to say that the kingdom of God has come near. And then to do what Jesus has done so that people both hear that the kingdom of God has come near and then they experience it. They, they are forgiven of their sins and then they experience a taste of the justice of how things ought to be and shall be when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we get to the end of Scripture, Revelation 19 to 22, and we begin with this proclamation of justice, uh, and we read the great multitude breaking out in song together that evil is defeated, and there is a new heaven and a new earth as all that is old has passed away, and earth and heaven are made and remade correctly and right. As the new Jerusalem comes down and the home of God is among humanity, then every tear will be wiped away and death will be no more, and all who thirst will be given the water of life. And into this wonderful, beautific vision, we hear the proclamation that I will be their God and they will be my children. This is the refrain that runs through Scripture again and again and again. The invitation, I will be your God and you will be my people. And God keeps on offering that. Here, follow me, Abraham, and I will be your God and you will be my people. Here's the Ten Commandments. Follow these and I will be your God and you will be my people. Here are the prophets. Come and follow their call and I will be your God and you will be my people. And again and again, God is calling for, you. I will be your God and you will be my children, my people. We will be family, right? Family remade as it ought to be. Because let's be honest about family. It can be the greatest blessing, but sometimes it is not. Family remade just as it ought to be. I find that far more beautiful than any image of the jewels in the... Uh, in the gates or the paving of, of gold. You know, that's nice. That's beautiful. What is far more beautiful to me is this promise of I will be their God and they will be my children and, and the family will be as it ought to be all gathered around the table with Jesus at the head of the table feasting together as family. And you read on and a little bit further into Revelation, we read that all the people will be gathered and they will be given the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nation. And if you read this, and then you read Genesis, what you'll hear is it's the Garden of Eden, right? The Garden of Eden is the place where there's the tree of life, where those who eat of it are healed. And, and the, the humanity leaves the garden, but in the city of God to come, we have the, the garden renewed, the garden accessible yet again. And in the midst of the city in which are gathered all those who love Jesus. And so this is the justice, not just of God and God's people uh, as family as they ought to be, but this is the, the justice and the proper relationship between city and garden, right? This is the reformation, reforming of all creation. The call of the church is to be the place where the kingdom is coming and is being experienced and, to, and is being received. 
Right? The place, to be the place where God's kingdom is breaking in and his will is done, where the end of the story is told and anticipated, to be the sanctuary from what is broken out there and is healed right here. Church is practicing heaven. That's what it is. We commit ourselves to be part of God's kingdom, God's politics, God's way of gathering people here, and we dare to call it church. We can only do so much when we're out there, and we will do it. But in here, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we are confident in a future that is already full. And we live into that future, and we taste that future as we are gathered around this table as Christ's family. My friends, the church... Our role as the church is not to offer solutions to the problems of the world. Our role is that the church is the solution to the problems of the world. Right? We don't offer solutions. Church is the solution. Right? If you have problems with the community being divided, what do you do? You get together, you confess, you pass the peace. You know what that sounds like? Church! Right? If you have problems where there not being enough to go around, how do you solve that when there's not enough to go around? You pass a plate. Then you gather as, as, as a community to eat a meal together. You know what that starts to sound like? Sure sounds like church to me. Right? You have pro people who struggle with grief and hope. Where are they going to hear the sermon that proclaims the good news of the resurrection? You're going to hear it anywhere other than church? The church doesn't offer solutions to the world. The church is the solution. The practices of church are what God gives us as a way to practice heaven, to be the inbreaking kingdom of God. You tell me about a problem, and I'm going to I can guarantee you what my response to that problem is going to be. Fundamentally, my answer to every problem you can bring me is we need to church. We need to gather in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church is always the answer, and it is not because we are so amazing. I love you all. Yeah, I love you. But you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We're not, church is not the answer because we're so amazing. Church is the answer because Jesus is perfect, and he promises to send his Spirit upon us. We follow a risen Lord who is leading us toward the kingdom of God to come, and this is where it is breaking in. This is where it is happening. And so as we gather in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are marking this time as God's time and God's place, where thy will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We are in the season of Easter, and we will be for a few more weeks. And the message of Easter is both forgiveness, and it has to be justice as well. For if we only talk about forgiveness, and we do not talk about justice and making things right, then our discussion of forgiveness becomes vapid and spineless. Because talking about forgiveness is all about the past. And for people who struggle for the future, who struggle with what tomorrow might bring, forgiveness is fine, but we need justice for tomorrow. Forgive, forgiveness frees us from a past that is broken, but it is the promise of resurrection and the justice of the kingdom of God to come that gives us hope for the future. A hope for a future that is already full with God's plans. It is our calling us to, as a church to accept that the future is already full. The end is already written. We do not have to earn this future. We do not have to deserve it. We do not have to build it. What we do is we accept it. We accept that we are forgiven. We accept that the future is already written. We accept that there will be justice in the kingdom that is to come. And we graciously accept that being together as church is how we begin to experience it today. Thanks be to God. Amen.